Lecture 75, is the universe a black hole? Escape velocity in the Schwarzschild radius. So that's what the lecture today is about. Last time, you'll remember that we talked about the different kinds of orbits that we can get. And one of the orbits that we got was the parabolic orbit, where this could be the sun, for example, and maybe this is the Earth. We would hope not if we don't want to be in a parabolic orbit, right? It means we're only going to get the sun for a little while, and then we'll never see it again. Um, but let's say that we were. So where along this trajectory, we don't call them orbits when they're like this, right? We call them trajectories, OK? Because they're not bound to the system, right? Where along this path, and this goes out to infinity. I just didn't draw the whole thing because there's not a big enough whiteboard here, right? But where along this path would the force on the Earth be the greatest? Anybody? Over here? No. Here? No. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's why I drew the, the, the Earth there, right? So let's call this distance here like R min or something like that. That's the distance of close approach, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess you could call it apogee, but that doesn't seem to really fit since it's not an orbit. Anyhow, we'll call it that. And recall that we said under the condition that the effective potential is equal to zero, we get these parabolic orbits, right? And so what is it that's equal to zero exactly? Well, the effective potential was, let me just look it up here, one half L squared over M R squared, right? Yeah. Squared minus uh, big G, big M, well, that's the mass of the sun, um, little m, all over R. But here, what I'm interested in, right, is just this one point, R min, OK? So I'm actually only going to put R min in for the, gravita the actual gravitational potential part, right? Yeah. This, you'll recall, is just the angular momentum component, right? But I want to let R be able to change because we're in a trajectory. So we're going to, you know, R is going to change as we get farther and farther away from the sun. So if I set this equal to zero, that's pretty straightforward, right? We just get that 1 half L squared over M R squared is equal to big G, big M, little m over R min, right? Just add this to both sides. And we get that equality. Well, recall, right, that L, let's write over here, L uh, is equal to, um, what is L equal to? MR squared omega, right? So I'm going to make that substitution in here. And hopefully I get the algebra right. I'll just square everything. So I'll get M squared R to the fourth omega squared over MR squared equals big G, big M, little m over R min. And we can obviously get some cancellation that goes on here, right? So we'll get m r squared omega squared. All that cancels equals big G, big M over little, uh, little m over r min. Okay. Notice that we have the mass on both sides, right? We've talked about this before. This is that equivalence issue of inertial mass and uh, gravitational mass, right? The, the mass that's in the potential, the actual gravitational potential, we call the gravitational mass. Okay, this being in the, the one on the left here, having come from the kinetic energy, which ultimately comes from the F equals MA, uh, Newton's second law, right, that's the inertial mass. Okay, but they are equivalent, and I think the accuracy with which that's been determined is a ridiculous number, like 10 to the minus 11, right, uh, accuracy on that equivalence. But anyhow, so we can cancel that out there. The masses will cancel, so I can just get rid of that. I can move the two over here. Um, ah, well, we, what we need to do now is recall that V is equal to R omega, because I want to get this in terms of the velocity of this planet, right? Um, that's its, its velocity along the trajectory, right? So you can see that this is just R squared omega squared is just V squared, right? And so we get V squared equals 2 big G big M over R min. And if I take the square root of everything, then we now get, I can make that a little nicer, we now get that the escape velocity, which I'll just put it, call it v sub es for escape, is equal to two, uh, the square root of two g m over r min. We call that m is the mass of the sun. Okay. So that is the escape velocity um, for an orbit such as this. Um, but I think to get a better sense of what these escape velocities are all about, we're going to consider a slightly different situation. This is for an orbit, or well, a, a trajectory, like a scattering event, if you want. Um, but let's talk about something simple, like if I were just to like fire a rocket up here on Earth, how fast does a rocket need to go to escape Earth's gravity? Okay? okay. So for that, we're only really going to need this term here, right? Um, so let's have a look at that real quick. Okay. So now I want to just consider myself 
on the earth, okay? And I want to first connect our potential energy formula that we got. Uh, U equals minus big G, big M, little m over R to the one that we used when we started this course for kinematics, right? MGH, okay? So if this is the planet Earth, this big R sub E is the radius of the Earth, let's say. And if we're standing on the surface here somewhere, like I've shown right there, and we throw a ball up some height h, right? I want to express that h in terms of uh, this gravitational potential energy formula that we've used here, okay? So how would we do that? Well, we could consider the change in potential energy from, say, starting at a distance from the center of the Earth of r sub e, right? Because that's where we're all standing, approximately, up to some height h, or up to some height r, where r is, well, not a height, r is the distance from the center of the Earth, right? It's this dashed line that I've drawn here, right? So that, the whole distance is r. But we're going to break it up. We're going to say, well, big R, or little r, minus the radius of the Earth is just the height that we've thrown it up in the air, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Because yeah. I take the radius of the Earth, I add to that whatever height that pen goes up with, right? I say a meter, and that's how far it is from the center. And that's what would be used here, right? So, what is this going to be equal to? Well, I, I take it would be minus big G, big M, little m, over R, minus, a minus is plus, right? Big G, big M, little m, over R sub E, right? Yeah. That's just taking, it's a difference. This is a, just a, kind of a standard way to write a difference, right? I want to consider a change in potential energy from some distance, little r, uh, away from R sub E, okay? So we get this. But we can manipulate this a little bit. I can rewrite this as uh, big G, big M, little m, uh, over R times R sub E, all times the quantity. Well, since I divided out a 1 over R, big R, right, then in the first term here, right, I, I have a little r, so that means that I need to put in um, a, a big R. Oh, I, you know what I want to do? I want to take the first term, which is positive, right? So I have the r sub e in this one, so I need to put in a little r so that it cancels out, right, with this 1 over r here, right? Yeah. Minus, what I'm missing here is the big R, so I'll put that in, big R sub e. And you can see that applying the distributive property that multiplying through by this will give me back this, okay? But this, r minus re, that's just h, right? Yes? Yes. All right, next what I want to do is I want to recall, do you remember that little g we said was defined as uh, big G, big M, over um, R sub E squared, right? I think I, yes, that's correct. We defined this previously. So we said that the, you know, the 9.8 meters per second squared, or... 32 feet per second per second that we were using kin in kinematics is really just this term here, right? So let me put that in here. And so to do that, I'm going to have to, I'll put in big G, big M. I'm going to pull the little m out, and I'll put over R sub E squared, right? But I've got one too many R sub E's in here, right? So I need to pull one out, and so I'll put R sub E over little r, so we get the r back in, right? Just a little bit of algebra here. Um, this, of course, is g, so what we end up with is m times little g times the ratio r sub e over r. Okay? So near the surface of the Earth, right, little r is equal to r sub e, yes? Yeah. So if we're close to the surface of the Earth, oh, and I forgot h, times h, times h, this will go to 1, and so I'm just left with m, g, h. Yes? Yes. Okay. So now we've connected the gravitational potential energy formula that we got from Newton's universal law of gravitation to the uh, potential energy that we used uh, in kinematics at the very beginning of the course. Okay? Okay. So you see that these are the same thing if r sub e, or excuse me, little r, is approximately the same as big r. Okay? So now I want to talk about the escape velocity. Okay? And so I want to consider the limit as r as we've defined over here, goes to infinity in uh, delta u going from r sub e, the radius of the earth, out to some distance r. Okay? 
Now, in that case, what is this going to be equal to? It's just the same formula as I had before. I shouldn't have erased it, but I did. It's going to be the limit as r goes to infinity of big G, big M, little m uh, times, this time I'm just going to keep it as it was before, 1 over r sub e minus 1 over r, right? Yeah. Did I get that right? I think I did. Yeah, that looks good. And so what's going to happen here, right? Well, 1 over r sub e is a fixed quantity, so that's not going to change if r goes out to infinity. But here, if r goes out to infinity here, what is 1 divided by infinity? 0. 0. So this is going to go to 0. And so I'm left with this will be equal to big G, big M, little m over R sub e, raised to the earth, okay? okay? Well, if the kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy, right, if we have enough kinetic energy to be exactly equal to this potential energy, uh, what, what happens then, right? And so that would mean that we've got 1 half little m times V squared. This V, by the way, is going to turn out to be our escape velocity, right? Yeah. Is equal to big G big M, little m, over R sub e. Okay? Again, the inertial mass and the gravitational mass just cancel out because they are the same. Um, I can multiply through by 2 here again, get rid of that half, and I can take the square root. I can write a better square root than that. Why do I always mess up the square root? There we go. And we'll call this V escape. Square root of 2 times big G, big M, where M this time is the mass of the Earth, because we're thinking about throwing something or launching something from the surface of the Earth, right? So the mass here is Earth over the radius of the Earth. So remember last time with the orbit, it was like the, uh, the trajectory, rather. It was the distance of closest approach, right? Now it's the radius of the Earth, because we're starting from the uh, surface of the Earth, right? Which is the distance from the center of the radius of the Earth, yes? Yes. Does that make sense? Whereas when we were a trajectory, right, some kind of scattering event, uh, the distance of closest approach is as close as we got to the center of the sun, right, when we were considering that problem. Okay? So this is like the, still the, the, distance, the, closest, the distance of closest approach. Okay? Right. That's where the force is the greatest. That's, the, that's what we have to overcome. Okay? okay? So we get the same thing. So let's see. What, what would the escape velocity be, for example, for the Earth? Um, well, we need some numbers for that. Fortunately, I looked some numbers up. Uh, the radius of the Earth is about 6,378 kilometers, um, and the, do I need the mass of the Earth? I guess I do, but there's actually something we can do here. We can rearrange this a little bit. I forgot I was going to do that in terms of this, right? Yeah. So let's factor out the GM over RE, right, and let's put in little g. So this is 2 times little g. Well, let me just do it one step at a time. Big G, big M, over R sub E squared, but I didn't have an R sub E squared, so I have to multiply it by R sub E, yes? Yeah. And that will be equal to 2 times G times R sub E. Okay? So now, instead of using the mass of the Earth and stuff, we can just use G, 10 meters per second per second. Okay? Alright. And so for Earth, I'll call this escape velocity Earth. Um, what's that going to be? It's going to be 2 times, I said 6,000 what? We'll just call it uh, 6 times 10 to the 6 meters, okay? And uh, I'm not going to put units in, but, uh, and then we'll need times 10 in here, okay? Just leave the units out. So what do we get here? That's 60, oh, okay, there we go, yeah. That's going to be 60 times 10, which is 120 times 10 to the 6. But you know what we can do? I mean, 120 and 121 are pretty close, right? Yeah. So let's just say this is approximately the square root of 121 times 10 to the 6, right? We can separate these two roots, right? It's 121 times the square root of 10 to the 6, yes? Yes. Square root of 121 is just 11. The square root of 10 to the 6, well, it's 10 to the 6 over 2, right? So that's 10 to the 3. So times 10 to the 3, which is going to be 11,000 meters per second. It's pretty fast, right? Yes. I, I, ahead of time, converted this number to uh, miles per hour just for comparison. It's about 25,000 miles per hour. Okay? Okay. If we were to do a similar calculation on the moon, uh, I did in my notes. What did I get? 
Yeah, for the moon, it brings this number down to about 2,200 meters per second, or about 5,000 miles per hour. It's still a pretty fast clip. So if you've ever watched, you know, videos of these astronauts walking on the moon, and you wonder, gosh, I wonder if they, if they jumped a little too much, would they fly off into space forever? No, they wouldn't. The, the moon is like a third the mass of the Earth, and uh, I think it's a sixth gravity. Um, the escape velocity is 5,000 meters or miles per hour. Miles per hour. They're not going to be able to jump and obtain that kind of velocity, so they'll always come back down, right? But anyhow, so that's the escape velocity, and that's what it means, right? That's what the velocity you need to get away from the Earth's gravity. And when you do this, whether you're in that parabolic trajectory, or whether you're just jumping or flying straight up in a rocket ship, right? You're going to coast out to infinity. Uh, your velocity is always going to get slower as you go, but infinitesimally so, okay? So you'll just travel on forever if you were to... Uh, have exceed this escape velocity, right? You no longer would be parabolic; you'd be hyperbolic, right? All right. Um, this will turn out to be important later. Uh, we'll talk about Big Bang theory and co-moving coordinates and the Friedman equations and stuff like that, the expanding universe idea. Um, and so, when we do that, uh, this idea of the escape velocity uh, is going to be crucially important. It's basically, this is basically where we're going to start with the conservation of, of energy. Uh, to come up with these, what they call the Friedman equations, which describe the expansion of the universe. Okay? So the idea of escape velocities bring up an interesting question, right? Is there ever a gravitational field too strong uh, such that you can never escape? Right? Well, what's the ultimate speed limit in the universe? Uh, no. What you? Speed of light? Yeah, speed of light, right? Nothing can tra travel faster than the speed of light. That's, you know, one of the rules that we have uh, that seem to be true. Um, so nothing can exceed the speed of light, I suppose you should say. Um, so what if there was a gravitational field so strong, right, that even if you were traveling at the speed of light, you wouldn't be able to escape it? So that's what we're going to consider next. Is there a situation where the escape velocity for a gravitational body is greater than or equal to c, the speed of light? Well. Our formula for the escape velocity, right, is the square root of 2 big G, big M, the mass of the body, over, I guess we just call it R, yeah, just R, the radius of the distance you're separated from the body, okay? So that means, that, that's what the escape velocity is equal to, so is that ever greater than C, you see? So what we can do here, we can rearrange stuff a little bit, I'm going to square both sides, so we'll get rid of the square root. Make that a c squared. Um, g and the number 2 don't change, so I'm going to divide that over to the other side. So what we really get is this condition m over r greater than or equal to c squared over 2 big G. So there's a few things. You could have, say, a, a planet or a star whose radius was really small. Okay, If the radius is small enough, then you can get bigger than this quantity here. If I were to evaluate these, right, remember c is about... Uh, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, okay? So squaring that, it's 9 times 10 to the 16th. Uh, G it was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, I think. Uh, it's kind of small. But this is approximately on the order of, I think, 10 to the 27. No, 10, 7 times 10 to the 26. 7 times 10 to the 26, okay? Okay. So, or you could have a really huge mass, okay? If you had a really huge mass uh, at the right separation from the center of all of that mass, uh, you could exceed this, right? And you'd be in this situation. So what do we call this situation? We call them black holes, right? The radius in question here is called the, Schwarz the Schwarzschild radius. It's named after a guy who came up with this stuff, though I don't think he was actually, I don't think he anticipated black holes, to be honest. Um, this kind of classical formula, so we can, of course, derive, we'll call it R sub S is equal to this Schwarzschild radius. That's when these are equal. It's going to be equal to um, 2 big G, big M, um, over C squared. Okay? And, again, this is called the Schwarzschild radius. It is the, uh, the, sometimes called the event horizon if you're talking about a black hole. It's the point of no return. If you get closer to the black hole than this, then you're never coming out, ever. Okay? You just can't escape. Not even the light can escape. Okay? If light can't escape, nothing can escape. Um, so if we were to use this and say, well, how small would the Earth have to be if we kept the same mass we have currently? How small would the Earth have to be for it to be a black hole? And the answer is it's about a centimeter, so about the size of a marble. Okay? If the Earth was the size of a marble but had all the mass that we, we currently have, then it would be a black hole. The Sun, oh, I don't remember.
remember. I didn't even do a calculation for the sun, but um, bigger than a marble. But uh, can I think of anything that sounds right? No, not really. I'm trying to think of an object, a common object to relate to you, but I, nothing's coming to mind. Um, this is not how he, it's not named after him because he derived something that looked like this. This is a, a classical derivation, okay, using New, Newtonian physics. Um, the actual source shield radius came out of a term. So Einstein came up with this general theory of relativity, which we will talk about a little bit. We can't do it because it, it's, it's too hard. Um, but we'll talk about it a little bit, okay? And he gave this presentation on his new theory, and he said, well, here it is. Here's my field equations, right? We call them the Einstein field equations now. I don't know what he called them then. It's, here's some equations. Um, but uh, he, he assumed nobody would ever be able to solve these things, right? And there was a guy in the audience. He was home on leave from the war. He was fighting in World War I. I think he was an artillery officer or something like that. Um, he took some leave, went to Berlin, saw this talk that Einstein gave, and in a matter of months, I think, solved the Einstein field equations. It's not the only solution. There are many solutions, just like there are many solutions to many equations. Um, but he came up with a way to find a solution. Too, he was trying to explain, like you know, or you know, the orbit of Mercury and stuff like that, uh, which has is, we don't get it quite right with Newtonian physics. It's a little too close to the sun, so when the gravity is strong, you need. Einstein's th uh, general theory of relativity, okay? Earth, you know, you can do without it. It's not going to make a difference. We get the uh, orbits very accurate just using Newtonian calculations. Uh, but for Mercury, there's a small correction that's needed uh, that you get from general relativity. Anyway, but in this, he, he had a term in his metric that looked something like this. It was like uh, 1 minus 1 over, um, no, sorry, that's not right. It's 1 over 1 minus 2gm over c squared r, okay? This was a term that he had in his uh, metric. And you can see that if this term here is equal to 1, you've got 1 divided by 0, you have trouble. Something goes crazy, okay? And I don't think he really cared or paid attention to it too much. I think when people saw it, at some point they said, well, let's you know, do some calculations on some stars that we know and see if that's ever a problem. They said, no, it's not. It's not going to happen, so we're not going to worry about it. And then sometime later, maybe the 40s or 50s or 60s, something like that, this idea of a black hole was proposed. Okay? It's, it's, it's a relatively new idea. As you may or may not know, black holes have been verified, and we have, we have an image of a black hole uh, that was made a few years ago. But uh, I know you're like, well, if it's black, then how do you take an image of it? And that's a, a little bit of a complicated question. And we'll maybe talk a little bit about it. Uh, when we talk about general relativity, we spent some time doing space-time diagrams, so maybe we can do something with black holes, okay, and talk about how things behave close to a black hole. But anyways, so here we have the, this is where it really came from. Someone said, well, when this becomes one, things are become, you know, quite crazy. But then, you know, you get this sort of kind of a coincidence, I guess you might say, that this maps on to this classical calculation for the escape velocity that we just did, okay? Okay. But maybe not, you know. If, if the, the, like I said, there are a couple of types of black holes. You've got... Black holes that have a whole lot of mass, right? And the distance is not all that small, okay? And if the distance is not all that small compared to, say, the size of me or my spaceship that I'm in, right? Then being near the event horizon is not going to be a big deal. If I cross it, I'm never coming out. But if I'm just close to the event horizon, I'm not going to notice anything unusual, right? Just like I don't notice anything unusual here near the Earth. But if I was, say, you know, 100,000 miles wide, right, the, the, the tidal forces from the Earth, which we haven't even talked about yet, but we will, Right, could uh, make me feel a little funny. Right? I'd be pulled on at my feet more than I am from my head, and that would be odd. Uh, so if you have a black hole which has a really small radius, right, but huge amount of mass, obviously you need a huge amount of mass, uh, then near that event horizon, the, the, the tidal forces would be devastating. Uh, but if it's a really large mass, then it wouldn't, you wouldn't hardly notice it. Okay? And so that brings up the question, I guess, of is the universe a black hole, right? And so why, why, why would I ask such an absurd question? Because you're like, well, of course not. But let's just apply the formula we have here, okay? And we'll use some numbers that you can get off of the Internet. Uh, the mass of the observable universe, let's call it m sub u, is approximately an order of 10 to the 53 kilograms. And the estimated radius of the observable universe, right, uh, is on the order of... I have to look at that. Uh, 46.5 billion light years, so 
about 4 times 10 to the 26 meters, okay? We, I can't really say what these numbers mean exactly. I don't actually know about the, uh, the radius part. I have a suspicion, but uh, not, not positive on that. But if we use these numbers and we think of it like a star or any other body, right? And we plug them into this, right? What do we get? So the Schwarzschild radius for the universe, let me just write this down over here. R sub S is equal to 2 big G big M over R. Uh, C squared. So Schwarzschild radius for the universe would be equal to, well, we got 10 to the 53 kilograms uh, over this times 2g, well g is uh, on the order of uh, 1.48 times 10 to the 26, right, is the order of this Schwarzschild radius. Compare that with the radius of the universe, okay? Notice that this is smaller than this, which suggests what? That the universe may be a black hole, right? Um, is it? I don't know. It would be interesting if it was, right? It would be like, in the past, we were, of course, we had a much smaller radius, the same mass. Um, so we, we would have been a black hole in the past. So maybe it's such that the universe begins as a black hole, and after, you know, 10, uh, 14 billion years or so, uh, it gets close to kind of the end of its black hole time, and then it is no longer a black hole, and you can actually escape the universe and go into the larger cosmos of all the other universes that are out there. Who knows? Um, but it's interesting nonetheless, right, that the radius of the universe, however it is they estimate this, I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, is related or close to the Schwarzschild radius if we consider the universe to be a black hole, okay? okay. Um, one caveat, right? these are of course, these are co-moving coordinates and we haven't even talked about that yet, but uh, this observable radius universe is a co-moving number and uh, maybe that makes the argument silly uh, to even discuss, but I thought it was interesting anyhow, right? Wouldn't that be cool though if like at some point in the near future, like say in the next 100 million years or so, in the near future, uh, the universe is no longer closed and you can actually get out of it and see other universes or something? I mean, that'd be neat, right? Yes. Yeah. But I mean, if you did live in a black hole, would it be all that bad? No, not really. Not, you know, unless it was like a really small black hole compared to you, right? Then it would be horrible because it would rip you to pieces. Um, but uh, if it was you know, black holes on the inside, you wouldn't even notice. If you go into a black hole, you wouldn't even notice. You'd be like, oh, it looks like space like it did before. There are a few things that you would see that are unusual. And obviously, we don't know that you'd see them because nobody's ever gone into one. Maybe when you cross over the event horizon, you would see everything that ever did cross the event horizon come across all at once. I, I don't know. But anyway, we'll talk about that kind of stuff uh, in a later lecture when we do specifically talk about black holes. Um, any questions? What do you mean by other universes? Oh, sorry. Uh, there is a, a theory. I, 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 it's not a crackpot theory, but it's not mainstream either. Okay, and it's called the Many Worlds Theorem of Quantum Mechanics. It's based on a, a, a Wheeler. Wheeler wrote a paper back in the '60s on this idea, this Many Worlds Theorem, and it has to do with quantum entanglement and the possibility of a whole bunch of universes, each one for different. It's not true that every action you take would spawn a new universe, where one universe is if I decide to go right and the other universe is where I decide to go left. It's actually reserved for very specific types of things, uh, where there is entanglement, quantum entanglement. Uh, so my decision of whether to wear a blue jacket or a tweed jacket would not generate new universes. And, uh, but anyways, it, it's a theory. Um, and so is it wrong? Well, I, who knows? I can't say. Um, but it's certainly possible, I suppose. So that's what that's referring to. I mean, it's not impossible, right, that there'd be a bunch of universes, and uh, that one day when our, you know, observable uh, radius uh, becomes big enough that we can actually cross over the boundary, right, and escape the gravity of all the stuff in, in our universe. Yeah? Yeah. But I don't know. Seems cool. Yeah. Okay? That's it.